What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another video. Today, I'm going to review X-Men Apocalypse. So, without further ado, let's begin. So, when I was going to go and rewatch this movie today, I was kind of going to go in and hate it because a lot of people do not like this movie for some reason because it was directed by Brian Singer, who directed the best X-Men movies, actually. He directed the original two, he directed Days of Future Past, and he directed this one. And to be honest, I actually really like this one. This is my second time watching this movie, and it was a lot better than I remembered. It has a lot of great moments. I like the new cast, because this is pretty much around the 80s. Sure, it does have a bit of retconning stuff and confusing, but it is still a good X-Men movie as a whole, once you think about it. Like, when you watch it on your own, be like, hey, it's a pretty good X-Men movie, and it kind of fits in the timeline somewhere. It's just, you know, the aging stuff, and we'll talk about the aging stuff soon, but... The villains in this movie are great. Like, everything about this movie is great. It's no masterpiece. Like, so far, none of the X-Men movies are, like, perfect, but they are pretty good. But I will say that Bron Series 4 X-Men movies, this is probably his weakest one. But, however, I will say it's still a great X-Men movie, and I will say it, I like it more than First Class, and maybe I like it more than The Wolverine. I'm not sure about The Wolverine part, but I'm definitely sure about First Class. First Class is still good, but it's like, you know, kind of felt like it went on for too long, but it was still good. But it's like, I felt the cast for the X-Men wasn't as strong as the other X-Men films. So, yeah, let's get straight to the topics. So the film begins 10,000 years ago with Apocalypse being the first mutant ever to exist. And pretty much he's going to get a new body because his old one's dying and stuff. So I guess he's mortal at the time. And, you know, in order for Apocalypse to, like, I guess, take over the world in the future or someday, he needs to be, well, get trick as soul, I guess, transferred to another body so he can become the new Apocalypse or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, this took place 10,000 years ago. And pretty much we can put the 10,000 years ago stuff in the original timeline, because, you know, it still happened. It's just Apocalypse never woke up until the new timeline happened. So, yeah. So, I will say the beginning of the t of the years ago stuff was, like, you know, it was kind of, eh. I would feel like, eh, that was kind of bad. I didn't like that part. I would say the few minutes of the beginning was kind of bad. That's why I kind of was like, eh, it's not getting good. But as the film went on, I'm like, wow, I'm actually really enjoying this. Like, it was, a, it was surprisingly, this is actually the longest X-Men movie and it felt shorter than I expected. I'm like, wow, I thought I'd be bored with this one. I thought I would almost fall asleep. Well, no, I was actually enjoying this movie, which was surprisingly shocking for me. This is probably one of the biggest retcons of the film and the whole timeline is that, and well, for this movie, is that that Angel is in the 80s and this film takes place in the year 1983, 10 years after... Days of Future Past a story in the past, which was 1973. And we'll get to the aging stuff, which is a problem, but... I think the angel being in the 80s and the aging thing is probably the only complaints I have with these movies. Besides that, everything else is actually pretty good. So Angel just got back, well, just finished fighting the blob. Yes, the blob. We actually can tell it's the blob because the big fat guy and he had the blob costume. It's not the blob from X-Men Origins Wolverine. No, that's out of existence now. It's not canon anymore. We have the real blob for just short cameo, but I'm like, holy shit, it's the blob. Like, I never, I never remember this part. I do remember this is where not, he fights Nightcrawler, and Nightcrawler defeats him, and he loses a piece of his wing. And when Apocalypse finds him later, he turns Angel into Hawk Angel, but it's not the cool Hawk Angel we see in the comics or in the cartoon or Wolverine the X-Men, not that angel. Instead, it's like some weird emo type Hawk Angel, which is weird. Like, he's not blue. Like, God, oh, where's that angel? But whatever, that's really the only complaint I have for Angel. I will say that Angel, I like Angel here more than how he was in Last Stand. Because in Last Stand, it seems like he'd be a very important character. But he had, like, a little story arc. And it seems like he was going to be an important character. But he was just a throwaway character once they got to the Dark Phoenix plot of the film. So he was just useless in Last Stand. Sure, he doesn't do much here. But hey, at least he, like, you know, has a reason or something. Like, he lost his fighting career and just had Apocalypse join him because, you know, his wings were fucked up, and yeah, he's Hawk Angel now. So before I get into the aging topic, which is probably, like, my really, my really last negative complaint about the movie, the rest will be positive from here on out. So I want to talk about the villains real quick. So, of course, the main villain is Apocalypse, because it is called X-Men Apocalypse, and he looks pretty good for design. I like the design. Sure, he's not big and huge like he is in, like, the cartoons and the comics, but we do get a sh of him transforming into, well, being big, like, you know, almost the size of Galactus. Well, not really the size of Galactus, but you know what I mean, like, big like that. But Apocalypse is really cool in this movie, and I like the costume designs for the characters in these movies. I say this is where the costume designs for the X-Men start to get really good, 
but they were just thrown away in Dark Phoenix. And we'll get to the costume designs at the end, at the very end of the film, not for the final battle. I mean, like, what they wear at the very last scene. So the villains are Magneto. Magneto is evil again in this film because he had a, he retired and had a family. But then once he was trying to, once something was about to happen to one of his coworkers, he used his powers to save that person because it was either that or the guy would die. And everyone saw it and they warned the, that the police that Magnet, that he's a mutant and they accidentally kill his family because it's, it turns out his daughter had powers. It's not Wanda, no. It's a different daughter. A daughter they just created for the movie. And it shows you that just Magneto just can't get a happy ending. So Magneto turns evil again and pretty much just sees Charles' view as used pointless. So that's why he's evil again. But then he comes to his senses and, like, helps the X-Men defeat Apocalypse. Which is a badass moment. Like, Magneto is pretty good in these movies. I think after... Yeah, I think despite even the bad one, Last Stand, Magneto was pretty good in these movies. Magneto was always good in these movies. He, like, even the bad ones. He was never bad in these movies. Uh, probably except for Dark Phoenix. I think every character was bad in that movie. Like, just not, like, oh, they're bad guys. No, more like, oh, they're just written awful. Like, Magneto was pretty good here. And I've already talked about Angel. There's Psylocke, who doesn't do much. Like, she's in the film for, like, maybe two minutes. She's at the final bow or a cool costume. I like how it's accurate, so that's pretty cool. But pretty much once Apocalypse is defeated, she just leaves the film. We see her leave the battlefield, and we never see her again in the timeline. So it's like, eh, whatever. She probably went somewhere to die, or she probably is going to be in Deadpool 3. But it's not going to be the same version, because, you know, Deadpool is not in the same continuity as these movies. And then there's Storm, who I was shocked when I found out she was a bad guy in this movie. She wasn't really a bad guy. She was more of mind-controlled by Apocalypse. And she seemed to have that look where she had that mo- You know that Mystique design where she had that mo- Not Mystique, Storm, Storm. Why did I say Mystique? Storm. Storm had the design where she had that mohawk. You know that mohawk, that design, and the leather and stuff? Yeah, it seemed like they were going for that. And I, I don't know if- I haven't read that comic where she had that design, but- I don't think she was a bad guy. I think they just had her be bad or mind control by Apocalypse because she looked up to Mystique because, like, the mutants pretty much looked up to Mystique now because of what happened at Days of Future Past. And she considers Mystique her hero. And if you watch X-Men Evolution and you see the relationship Storm and Mystique have, you might find it weird because they do not like each other. Like, I actually consider Storm and Mystique very bad enemies like, if I had, was playing a Marvel fighting game and I had to have Storm fight someone, I would always pick Mystique. Because I'm like, oh, they seem like the perfect characters to fight each other. Like, that's what I like about X-Men Evolution is that they seem to have, like, a one-off relationship. Like, they seem to not like each other, they help each other, but they still hate each other. And I just find it weird here. But at the end, Myst- not Mystique, Storm decides to join the X-Men at the end. She just watches in the distance at everything because, you know, she's mind-controlled, I think. But... Well, no, not mind control. She just comes to her senses at the end because her hero's in the final battle. So she decides to join the X-Men anyway because, you know, she wants to be part of the good team and stuff. Yeah, that's kind of weird. She's like, she's just like, oh, Apocalypse Lost. She'll just join the good team. So, yeah, that's one complaint. But the rest of the film is still good. But it's like, you know, the Storm thing, eh. But, hey, Storm's design is pretty cool in this movie. And they got a good actress to play uh, a young Storm. So, really, this is more of a nitpick complaint, but it's kind of something that needs to be addressed, and a lot of people have done it before, and that is that the aging thing for the characters is that First Class took place in the 60s, 1962, I believe. Yeah, 1962. And Days of Future Past took place, well, the past part was in 1973, and this takes place in 1983, and they haven't aged a day, mainly everyone who's in First Class, like Beasts... Havoc, well, Havoc looks like he has age because of that long hair he has in this movie. Nice hairdo, though, Havoc. Really, really sick. But Quicksilver, like, Xavier, Mystique, Magneto, they all look like they haven't really aged a day because this film was made two years after Days of Future Past. And we we finally see um, Charles Xavier's love interest return that it was in first class. And he says she looks like she hasn't aged a day. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Like, because they're making a joke be like, you know, because they look like they haven't aged at all. And it's supposed to take place in 1983. When this could have just taken place about maybe hmm, two years later. You know, like just 1975 or 6 or whatever. Yeah, maybe around that time where it happened. Because I think that will be make more sense, but it's just a nitpick, because, like, well, no, that's, because, you know, there's, they look like they haven't aged a day, but whatever, I guess, you, you can't really do anything about it, 
But I mean, like, yeah, that's just a nitpick, but it's like, you know, it's something that had to be addressed, but it still doesn't confuse the timeline. Like, oh my god, this one thing affects the timeline, because, like, how's this character here when he was supposed to be there? Like, not like with Toad and Days of Future Past. No, it's not like that. It's more of, like, you know, just the aging thing. Who knows? Maybe they, well, they're obviously aging, because, like, not Asian, aging, aging. They're, I'm sorry, I'm stuttering. They're obviously aging, but it's like, you know, they look like they have an age a day. So it's like, whatever. Probably until, well, Dark, well, no, Dark Phoenix isn't canon. I don't care if they say it's canon. That shit is not canon to me because that just affects the timeline. So this is canon. Dark Phoenix is not. So yeah, that's one issue is that they look like they have an age a day. But other than that, you can still enjoy the movie. I would just say that you cut the 1983 thing and have maybe say two years after the Days of Future Past when they were in the past part, like, that would make more sense to me. Because Quicksilver is clearly the same age from the last movie. He looks like he has an age a day. And they're supposed to be like 10 years after that. So yeah, that's one weird complaint or n weird nitpick. But it had to be addressed. So just like Days of Future Past, we get another great scene with Quicksilver. Where everything is slow motion. We see his powers and he's listening to good music while he's doing it. And like, wow, they got this scene again. Like, this is the best part of the entire movie. Where the, the song Sweet Dreams is on and he's like saving everyone from the um the man that's about to explode because you know uh, magneto and apocalypse kidnapped charles xavier and havoc was about to like you know use his powers until like you know he accidentally blows out the place and it kills him but quicksilver manages to save everyone else but his little brother cyclops yes cyclops is in this well actually no you should have known that by now but yeah cyclops um little older brother is havoc and well havoc's dead now and he tries to avenge Havoc, and he says, like, it should have been him, but Gene read uh, Havoc's mind, so, like, he wanted you to be the better person and stuff, so it's, like, you know, that sweet moment and stuff, but, yeah, I like the scene with Quicksilver in this movie, like, his scene in Days of Future Past was great, and his scene in Apocalypse is great as well, like, Quicksilver has the best scenes of these two X-Men movies. It's a shame they pretty much get rid of him in Dark Phoenix, they don't kill him off, but they just, like, get rid of him for the most of the film. Like, you're like, hey, you like the best character of the last two movies? Well, we're getting rid of him this time. So, yeah, fuck you guys. We're just milking this shit. At least they're not doing it with this movie, which I thought they would, but surprisingly, they're not. All right, Wolverine cameo, everyone. So, after Quicksilver saves everyone from the blast, Colonel Shrugger then comes in and kidnaps Mystique, Beast, Quicksilver, and um, Xavier's love interest, because, you know, he's remembers her again stuff but she didn't get her memory back till the end of the film and it was a nice moment that she got her memory back like i actually did kind of miss her character because i did think she, i thought she would be in days of future past but she wasn't but it's good that she because i knew she would come back like first class wasn't her last film this is probably her last film because i don't think she comes back in dark phoenix i wouldn't blame the actress if she read the script and be like fuck that like ugh. but anyways so Cyclops, Nightcrawler, and Jean Grey go to rescue them on Striker's Island, and they free Wolverine on the way, and Wolverine goes pretty much on a killing spree, and I like the Wolverine cameo. Yeah, Wolverine only makes a cameo, but what I like about it is that it gives you that X-Men Origins Wolverine vibe, the, the video game, not the movie. The movie sucks. The video game is awesome. Like, you know, my favorite part of the video game in X-Men Origins Wolverine is where he, like, goes on a killing spree, and Striker's, like, like, whatever, fa like, well, military base, or Stryker's military base, and pretty much goes on a killing spree. Like, it reminds me of that, but except it's not, like, you know, very violent. There's a bit of blood, which is pretty cool. So, like, if it went for an R rating, I mean, that'd be cool, but it'd be weird for an X-Men movie to go for an R rating, because if it was a Saul Wolverine movie, then it would work as an R-rated film, which, well, we got an R-rated Wolverine film, which was the best way to end a Wolverine film is to make it rated R. So, pretty much, young G. Grey, when they see him again, she restores most of his, half of his memory, and he runs around the world this, and we don't see him again. And Cyclops make a joke, says, like, I hope we never see that guy again, and I'm like, oh, 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 oh yeah, that's bad luck for you, man, because you're gonna see him for the rest of your life. And just be grateful he's not gonna be with your girl, or flirt with your girl in this timeline, because, you know, he meets young G. Grey, and now it's kind of weird, but whatever. Whatever. But, um, Yeah. So, we actually do get an after credit scene where they come, the Colonel Striker's play, I guess Colonel Striker's place? No, X, X Corpse thing, I forgot what it was, but they end up taking a DNA of Weapon X and plan on cloning him, hinting X-23, so they end up cloning him. Well, they don't show it, but they end up taking a sample of his blood or DNA and they plan on cloning him. And that's what we get at Wolverine that would probably hint X-23 and Logan. 
So I already talked about bits and pieces of Final Battle, like how Storm joins the X-Men once Apocalypse dies and like how, Man how Magneto betrays Apocalypse and rejoins the X-Men to help them defeat Apocalypse and Charles gives his love interest his her memories back and stuff like that. But as for the Final Battle itself, it's actually pretty good. Like a Hawk Angel dies, like when because you his, him and Psylocke went to the Quinjet about to kill the X-Men. Nightcrawler, for his first time ever managed to teleport more than one person away, um, he pretty much, after they do it, he gets knocked out. And pretty much, Psylocke managed to escape the Quinjet, but Hawk Angel was stuck because, you know, his wings, his metal wings, and he dies in it, and Apocalypse just comes out of the place he was meant to switch bodies with Charles, and he was just, like, useless. And pretty much, Psylocke just watches in the distance and all, because, you know, he pretty much lost her thing, you know, that sword, whatever glowy thing she has. When it comes to the X-Men, I don't really know a lot about Psylocke, so I'm just getting that out there. I know a lot about the main X-Men and some of the villains, like Magneto, of course. But when it comes to, like, you know, someone like Psylocke, who I know about, but just don't know, like, what her blade weapon, magical blade weapon is or whatever. I know it's not like, you know, she had a, she has something to, in order to make it work, but it's like, you know... I don't, I don't know how to describe it very well. But anyway, pretty much, Charles pretty much had a piece of him left in Apocalypse because Apocalypse wanted to switch. Like, when Apocalypse planned on switching bodies with someone, he was going to do Charles because Charles was able to to know where other mutants is. So Apocalypse is going to create the end of the world. So that's why he wanted to more his, combine his bio with Charles Xavier. But we get now young Charles is now bald. So that's cool. We see young Charles Xavier bald, which is pretty cool now. So... Pretty much when Charles goes inside Apocalypse's mind, they fight for a bit, and pretty much Charles is about to get his ass handed to him until Jean summons the Phoenix, yes, the Phoenix, and kills Apocalypse. And this is probably the perfect way to end the Phoenix. Like, you didn't need to bring it back in Dark Phoenix. Like, you didn't have to do that. Because it felt like a proper conclusion to the X-Men team, like, for this being the real last X-Men movie when it came to the team. And for Logan, it was just the, the end for the franchise in general. As for Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, like, that Logan was, like, the perfect ending. Well, this was, like, the first ending of the X-Men films. Like, be like, oh, Apocalypse is, like, this is, like, the part one of the last X-Men movie. Then we get to Logan, which is the real last part one, the real last conclusion of the X-Men franchise, while we're still going to focus on Deadpool. Like, that's what they should have done, but instead they decided to milk everything with Dark Phoenix after. Like, you didn't have to do the Phoenix shit again. Like, because you, you, you did a pretty good job with the part in, like, you know, um, Apocalypse, X-Men Apocalypse, because, like, you know, you just, she just used it to kill Apocalypse, and that was satisfying, like, pretty much, she, it seemed like she lost the Phoenix powers, but still had her powers, but she was able to control them now, so, and, like, you know, she was able to control them, a happy ending, because, you know, the future of this timeline is supposed to be a happy ending, so, I mean, it's like, she lost her Phoenix powers, but she still has, she's able to control her powers, and now, and the Phoenix is gone, so, like, yeah, it's supposed to be a happy ending, but Dark Phoenix ruined it all. So, for the last shot of this movie, we see Mystique telling the X-Men that they're not students anymore, they're now X-Men, and we see the X-Men in their iconic costumes. We see Mystique's classic costume, Jean Grey's classic costume, Beast, Nightcrawler, Cyclops, Quicksilver, and Storm. Like, look at this. Like, this is the original costumes from the comics, and it looks beautiful. Like, these costumes were perfect. If they used these costumes in X-Men Dark Phoenix then I'd probably be like, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't great, but it's like, you know, the costumes are really cool. Like, the costumes here were perfect, and this shot right here would have been the perfect conclusion for the X-Men team for the movie franchise, and they officially concluded with Logan. Like, this, if this was the last X-Men team movie, then this would be perfect. And then Logan came out, and that'd be like, you know, the end for it in, as a whole. Like, th those, Logan and X-Men Apocalypse are kind of like the perfect conclusion to the franchise, but Dark Phoenix came in and ruined it all. Like, what the fuck is with those costumes in Dark Phoenix? Like, look at these costumes. They're so perfect. Like, look how great Nightcrawler looked. Look how great Storm looked. Like, look how great the X-Men look in this shot right here. Like, it looks perfect. They're so iconic-like. And instead, they just get these shitty-ass costumes in Dark Phoenix. Like, that just showed that they did not give two shits about the franchise anymore once they made Dark Phoenix. Like, 
And it wasn't Brian Singer when he directed the X-Men movies. He at least cared because he cared about the X-Men. Like, he made everything close to the comics as possible and tr do a few little minor changes. Like, this movie felt close, like, to the cartoon because of the apocalypse stuff and the costumes. Like, these costumes mainly. Like, it felt really cool and, like, so close to the 90s X-Men. Like, if you're an X-Men fan who reads the comics, then you'll know this is actually a good X-Men movie for X-Men fans. And the people who really just don't like it just probably just watch the movies or just watch the MCU and assume it's bad because, you know, the, the X-Men, well, Last Stand and Origins were at a time where super movies were going to be complete shit, mainly for Marvel, because they had, you know, the Fantastic Four and Daredevil and Elektra. They had those movies while the MCU was doing good. But the X-Men still had good movies in general. Like, again, the costumes for this shot right here, it's perfect. Like, this would have been the perfect conclusion to the X-Men team. But they had to ruin it all with Dark Phoenix. So that was my review of X-Men Apocalypse. So for my conclusion, I'm going to give X-Men Apocalypse a 7 out of 10. I was going to give it an 8 and say I liked it better than The Wolverine. But the more I thought about it, I actually enjoyed The Wolverine much better. So I give this one a 7 out of 10. I will say I like it more than X-Men First Class. X-Men First Class is still good and I gave it the same rating as this film. But I like X-Men Apocalypse a bit better. So yeah, 7 out of 10. Let me know what you guys think of this movie. And I'll see you guys next time in our review of Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool. Peace out, y'all. See ya, chump.